Uh, we have a wonderful session today. Uh, let me invite Dr. Kiran Sauji to address the meeting. Yeah. Kiran Sauji, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Rajendra. On, on behalf of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, I, Dr. Kiran Sauji, Executive Member of MOA, welcome our beloved President, Dr. Gadegone, Dr. Narayan Karne, Moderator, Dr. Rajendra Chandak, Convener, Dr. Mandar Agashi. I also welcome today's renowned faculties, faculty members, Dr. Taral Nagra, Dr. Atul Bhaskar, Dr. Viraj Singhade, and case presenter, Dr. Rathod and Dr. Avishah. I also welcome Dr. Ashok Sham and Neeraj Bijlani and Poonam from Ortho TV, our main supporter of web webinars. This is a veteran surgeons forum. Today's theme is pediatric orthopedics, current concepts review. Dr. Taral Nagada is going to speak on growth modulations. Dr. Manda Ragashi will enlighten us on Perthi's disease. Dr. Viraj Singhade will highlight the treatment of neglected club foot. And Dr. Atul Bhaskar will be speaking on walking age DDH. Dr. Rathod and Dr. Shaha will be presenting cases. Now, I hand over the proceedings to convener Dr. Mandar Agash. We would have a, a brief uh, introduction by our Honorable uh, MOA President, Dr. Gadegane, sir, who has kindly so, agreed to join us, please, sir. So, I am Dr. Gadegane, President of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. Welcome all moderators, speakers, and coordinator of this uh, very prestigious webinar on the pediatric uh, uh, surgery. So, I welcome you all. And I am very happy that you have devoted your early morning for the cause of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association educational program. Thank you very much, Mandar, and just Dr. Chandak, yourself, and Dr. Um, Sauji are helping in this uh, webinar, and it will be a very a good webinar for the learning uh, from the learning point of view. So best luck and continue your proceeding. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for this address. Um, uh, we would now be by proceeding for our lectures. Uh, we have one of the most renowned pediatric orthopedic surgeons from uh, in India, Dr. Taral Nagda, who will be talking taking the first lecture on a very important topic and an extremely common topic, which is uh, angular deformities, specifically around the knee. And the new concept of growth modulation is something which has fascinated us for many years. So we have Taral sir, who is, who is the chief consultant at the SRCC Children's Hospital and Jupiter Hospital, uh, who will enlighten us about this topic. Over to you, Taral sir. So, Mandar, thanks uh, for inviting us uh, for this webinar. Uh, uh, the, this, is, this is something I everyone wants to do it. I think we are missing the link or we'll have And when there is an easy tool and everyone wants situation where precision, am I being heard, Mandar? And is my there is a, a bit of lag and we are not able to see your screen, sir. We are, we are not able to see the screen, sir. Okay. Is it seen now? No. No, sir. Now we can see. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's start. <laughs> okay. So well begun is half done, uh, but I, I think my time starts now. Uh, so growth modulation is children. You are going to discuss indication, pitfalls, and advances. And uh, let's start. So all of us know that when growth is affected, you get a deformity. Okay. On the other hand, if you can control growth, it can lead to correction of a deformity. That's the basic principle of this method to control growth and use it to correct a deformity. And how does it work? It's like an Elizabeth of apparatus where there is a hinge at one place. So you restrict growth at one end and allow growth to continue on the other hand and that will correct a genoa algum deformity in a child. So that is basically growth modulation. Uh, uh, an example here, this is a child with renal osteodystrophy and uh, the, the question is if we have to do a growth modulation, how do we do it? In 1932, Femister came up with the suggestion to permanently damage half of the physis that would allow the growth to continue on the other side. So this is permanent 
uh, hemiepiphysiosis. 1949, Brown say that why do permanent when you can control it? So he devised these staples and he never put one staple. He put almost three staples to control genuvarum in this child. The issues with staples were they, they would break, they would bend or they would extrude out. And that's why this whole procedure fell into disrepute. Not because principles were wrong, but because the device was not correct. And this whole thing got revived almost half a century later. when Peter Stephen described his eight plates, eight plates which made the correction more predictable. Okay. So not only, you know, for correction of growth, uh, this can also be used for correction of limb length discrepancy. For example, this child who had septic arthritis of the knee, and you can see in the middle x-ray, that almost, you know, the middle phys, epiphysis is absent. However, that got, you know, that reappeared later on, but this child had limb length discrepancy. And you can use growth modulation when you use it on both sides to correct limb length discrepancy. And we could correct this child's limb and equalize it with use of this growth modulation. The issue with permanent epiphysiodesis is the timing of delivery. It has to be done on a particular day and if you believe in Vastu or Murta at a particular time, so that at end of the growth, the, the deformity will be corrected completely. If, if you do it before that, then it will be overcorrected. If you do it after that, then it will be undercorrected. So the problem is it's difficult to find that day when this has to be done. Not only that, it is difficult to have the patient coming to you exactly at that time so that that surgery would be possible. So permanent epiphyseal disease has hardly any role today, apart from correction of limb length disturbances. What we do is temporary growth modulation and the, the, the devices which are in our hand for staples and the plates. Now, why staples failed? Because staples, as you can see on the right side, they were rigid, they were constrained, they were spray shielding and multiple staples were required. On the other hand, the screws, the eight plate and the screws, they form a flexible device. It is unconstrained. It is load sharing and just a single plate is enough. Now, if you can see in this diagram that the force nucleus of a plate is outside the bone. And that's why there is not too much pressure on the physis. That's why this is a more physiological system. In the case of plate, the force nucleus is on the bone on the plate and that's why these plates fail they extrude and of course they have potential to damage the physis okay this is how normally an eight plate is done you do the surgery under tunique uh, you know put the plate on the patient's skin and and know your level and then as it's seen on the x-ray here you take a two centimeter incision mark center of the physis take an incision cut skin subcutaneous tissue and the fascia and as uh, Peter Stephen always says, pick up everything which your forceps can pick up. Whatever your forceps can't pick up is stuck to the growth plate and should not be damaged. That is how you decide the, the, the surgery level. And then you put the middle guide wire, put the plate over it, and uh, then put your screws. Now, on an AP view, the length of the screw is between one third to half of the facial width. You don't have to be very exact, you know, between one third to half will do. On a lateral, however, it should be precise and it should be in the center of the physis, not center of the bone. In case of femur, it should be center of the physis. So, you know, that is something which is important. And after the surgery, you know, no immobilization is required. You put compression bandage, give icing, you start mobilization as soon as the patient is pain free. Uh, call the patient once in a month for follow up if patient is away use of whatsapp images is very very useful for following the, these patients to see the intermalular distance and we do x-rays once in three months scanogram is generally done just before the implant removal once you are clinically and radiologically sure that the deformity is corrected so using this principle this was the child which we discussed renal osteodystrophy bilateral genovalgum deformity in lower femur and upper tibia so she was treated with four eight plates two in upper tibia to in lower femur on the medial aspect. And you can see at three months, hardly any correction takes place. Most of the correction will take place after three months. You monitor this patient at 12 months, you can see the knees look straight apart from right lower femoral physis. 
which is still to be corrected. So when do you remove the implant? As soon as the deformity is corrected, you remove the implant. You don't wait for overcorrection. Here on the right side, lower femur, you can still see the deformity was not fully corrected. So this was removed after two months. Okay. So this is a normal procedure of, you know, doing a growth modulation. Let's discuss some of the indications and pitfalls. And uh, I've divided them into this mnemonic, A, B, C, D, E, and F. So that it's easy for everyone to know. A stands for age. Now it's, it's uh, written in textbooks that at least two years of active growth should be there for this technique to succeed. And, and books say that uh, a boy, you know, less than 11, uh, a girl less than 11 years and a boy less than 13 years, you know, this, this technique will be sort of uh, successful. So this is a 12 year old girl with the genovalgum. And, uh, you know, we did a meet epiphysiotis on the medial side bilaterally. You know, so going by the indication, this would be a good indication. But if you see at one year follow up, there is no correction. At one and a half year again, she has persistent genoval. Now, why this happened? This happened because she had a menarche earlier. She was a early growth plate closure. Okay. And that's why it's important to realize that this girl required osteotomy ultimately. But this could have been prevented if growth modulation was not done. This was not a good indication for growth modulation. What should have been done is then rather than relying on chronological age, we should have relied on a bone age. And how do you determine the bone age? It's very simple. Take an X-ray of the elbow, the lateral view, and look at the olecranon epophysis. Now, that is important to, for you to know whether your growth modulation is going to work or not. In girls, the olecranon epophysis appears by 11 years, and it closes by 13 years. So if your olecranon epophysis is open and the epophysis is rectangular, it means that the bone age of that girl is 11.5 to 12 years. And that's a good indication to do growth modulation. Similarly, in boy, if you have olecranon epophysis, which is rectangular and fully open, it means a bone age of 13.5 to 14 years. And that's a good indication to do a, a growth modulation. So if you see olecranon like this, Okay. open olecranon or a rectangular olecranon, but no fusion. And that's a good indication to do growth modulation. If you are taking hand x-rays, then the appearance of the sismoid bone is, is a good indication for doing growth modulation. But if you have a child like this, where olecranon epophysis have not appeared, you don't see the first metata metacarpal sismoid bone. Or if the triradiate cartilage is open. It means it's too early to do growth modulation. If you do growth mod modulation, you will uh, achieve very early correction. You will remove the plate and there are chances that the deformity will recur. On the other hand, if say half of olecranon is fused or uh, uh, triradiate cartilage is completely fused, it means you have to do your growth modulation with caution. You have to tell patient that surgery should be done immediate instead of plate use screws. Or if you're doing genovalgum, do both femur and tibia so that you can achieve complete correction in these patients. And if olecranon is fused, if menarche is achieved, if riser 1 has already appeared on pelvic x-rays, these are the contraindications for doing a growth modulations. So I've just listed some of the, the contraindications for doing growth modulation. A closed physis is a contraindication. Skeletal maturity or less than two years available for growth is a contraindication. Physiological deformities will correct on their own error contraindication. Rotational deformities cannot be corrected and multiplanar deformities cannot be corrected. Hence, they are contraindications for doing growth modulations. Pathological physis need modulation at younger age. Please remember that. Don't wait for age of 10 years in pathological physis. For example, this child has multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. She is seven year old. And she was told by somebody that come at nine and we'll do surgery. This is not correct because she's a slow grower and hence correction also will be slow. So hence in her case at seven years age, we decided to do genovalgum correction by growth modulation. Now for doing at this age where olecranon is still not appear, there are challenges. And challenge is that the physis is not visualized well. It's not easy to put screws and hence we use what is known as arthrogram to delineate the, the cartilage. So this is how arthrogram is done. 
you delineate the cartilage and then pass these wires so that you know that your screw is exactly in the center of the physis. So that's an additional sort of a hint here. So this is a post-op X-ray. Though the you know the the screw looks uh, you know too close to the physis the articular surface, actually is quite away in this child, and you can see that in two years' time this got completely corrected. So pathological physis will also take a longer time to correct, and you should not expect miraculous correction in six or nine months in these patients. And then this is post-implant removal. Post-implant removal, again, you have to warn parents that the deformity may recur. There are some people who retain the implant, just remove the metaphyseal screw. And if the deformity recurs, put the metaphyseal screw again. But, but that's quite, uh, you know, sort of painful. If the parent, children don't accept that very well, the higher rate of complications. So I prefer to remove the entire implant. And if the deformity recurs, I will do a repeat growth modulation in these children. Now, coming to the second point, B is for bone. And as all of us know, lower femur, upper TBR are fast growers, upper femur, lower TBR are slow growers. Similarly, upper humerus and lower radius is a fast grower and elbow is slow grower. Now, we know this mnemonic, towards the knee we flee and away from elbow we grow. So this is cubitus varus. And I had an idea that why not do a growth modulation to correct cubitus varus. But this didn't work because elbow is a slow grower. Similarly, ankle, you know, so this child has ankle valgus because of multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. We put a eight plate on the medial side and it took almost two years for this deformity to be corrected. So ankle, elbow, upper femur takes a longer time. Knee is a fast corrector. So this is child with a congenital myopathy, had knee flexion deformity. We put two eight plates in front of the knee. Okay, avoiding the suprapatellar pouch and this deformity completely corrected in almost six months time. So you have to be more vigilant when you are correcting the knee joint because they can correct faster. C is for capacity of physis to grow and we'll see two examples, one of a sick physis and one of a physial bar. This child obese had sick physis on the lateral side from an injury, but the physis was open. So we did a growth modulation on the medial side. After year one year, you see there is hardly any correction. And it took almost two years for this deformity to be corrected because the opposite physis was not normal. This is a child who has, uh, you know, growth uh, bar on the medial side of uh, upper end of tibia causing varus. So somebody had advised him lateral growth modulation, but it would not work till the medial side growth is resumed. So what we had to do was do a bar excision and cement fixation on the medial side, put a plate on the lateral side. And in around one year's time, this completely corrected because the bar was excised. If it was not done, this would not have corrected. D is for disease. The physis affected by disease are slow to correct. And here I'm going to exam giving example of this malignant tibial tumor, which was replaced by a mega prosthesis after excision. And the child was subjected to radiation. Now, this child had genu valgum. You could not do an osteotomy in such small you know, area of bone. So we decided we will do growth modulation, lower femur and upper tibia. And this was done after four months, no correction. After eight months, no correction. And I realized this was happening because child was irradiated and the physis was slow to grow. Even his height was slowly growing. So we knew that this was a situation. But once that effect of radiation was over, almost two years later, it got completely corrected. And here, you know, I just want to, you know, share with all the pediatric orthopedic colleagues that when we measured the length from the physis to the implant, there was increase in growth both on medial and lateral side, which means that the eight blade doesn't stop growth. It modulates growth. And this was a lesson which we learned from this case. Some extended indications here. Uh, this is a child post-infective, very young child. And an option was to do osteotomy. But we did an MRI and growth plate was intact. So we did growth modulation on the medial femoral physis, uh, uh, on the lower physis. And then this completely corrected in around nine months time. So uh, the youngest child I've done is one and a half year uh, for growth modulation. Uh, it's not very easy. You have to use smaller plates and sometimes use an arthrogram. This is a child who had, again, post-infective genovalgum, but has a bony bar. So here, just growth modulation will not suffice. We did excision of the bar through an arthroscope, uh, through a window in the metaphysis. And medially, we did growth modulation. And this 
is corrected completely over a period of time. This is a multiple osteochondromatosis, so upper end of fibula with genovalgum. And you can see a massive um, uh, osteochondroma almost, you know, threatening the lateral peroneal nerve with uh, affection of the physis on both AP and lateral. So this we removed through a split fibula approach and then did growth modulation on the medial side, upper tibia, so that the deformity could be corrected. So these are novel methods where you don't have to do osteotomy, but growth modulation would suffice. This is 2.5 year old with uh, Neva. I think there is some issue with the network. Yes. Uh, and when he came, came with Janu Valgum deformity. And uh, you can see this X-ray, which shows the power of growth modulation. You know, such wide opening and deformity correction here. And uh, the treatment was simple. We reverse the plates, remove the lateral plates, put it on the medial side. And then when he corrected and wanted some time for implant removal, I said nothing doing, get admitted just now because we need to remove these implants tomorrow itself. You know, I'm not allowing you to go home and have one more recurrence or overcorrection. There are some newer advances, pearls in 2022. So some technological and some technical. So this is technical. This is how Peter Stevens described his method, central wire and then epiphyseal screw and metaphyseal screw. That's how he liked to do the things. You need to take a bigger incision here. And sometimes you are in trouble when the epiphysis is smaller. Now, draw Pele modified this method. And what he did was pass the epiphyseal guide wire first, then took the incision, then put the plate over. And then he passed the epiphyseal screw and the metaphyseal screw. This was draw Pele's method. This was Pele's modification of Peter Stevens' method. And now I'm going to show you. Nagda's modification of Pele's modification of Peter Stevens method. So what I do is, uh, you know, I want to do things through a smaller approach. So first put the guide wire, epiphyseal wire, take a small incision, slide the plate, and then pass the epiphyseal screw, then slide the incision over the metaphyseal slide, metaphyseal guide wire, and metaphyseal screw. So that allows the surgery to be done through a very small incision, almost uh, something like a uh, uh, through a, like a percutaneous screw fixation. And this is what I've been doing lately. Uh, so same method, but a different technique. And uh, I just want to end with an introduction to PET screw. This is what we have been doing now since last two years, preference over the plates. So I just want to show a case, Janu Valgum, treated with lower femoral and upper tibial PET screws. These are the partially or fully threaded 6.5 or 7 mm uh, cancellous screws, the entry point uh, uh, is percutaneous and we pass the guide wire in retrograde manner and screws in anti-grade manner. And, uh, you know, they allow cosmetic correction, faster correction and virtually pain-free. You know, patient has no pain, uh, any difficulty and, and really this is what I prefer nowadays. I want to show you one more case, you know, this child had genu valgum on the right side and tibial shortening. Now, you know, what we did was we put a paid screw for correction of genu valgum and two cross screw on the other side for restricting the tibial growth. And then this worked really well. So multiple, uh, multi-level growth modulations are also now possible. And about this, I'll talk sometime later on uh, because that's a little complex topic and I will need a little more time. There are two ways of doing it. You can pass cross screws or non-intersecting screws, but I prefer cross pet screws and advantage is it is cosmetic, allows early return to function and faster correction. So in summary, I just want to indicate it's a very effective method, simple method. Uh, decision is more important than incision. Prerequisite that minimum two years active growth should be present. The growth plate on the opposite side should be functioning. The process can be slower in pathological physis or physis which are slow to grow. And lastly, uh, you know, there are newer methods of fixing it. And uh, I also want to say it on record 
since we have done a study now that I prefer pet screws over eight plates for correction of deformities through growth models. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Excellent, yeah. excellent talk. Uh, so, so I, I have been doing the Palais methods in the last few years, and I thought that I am doing something new. And uh, as as usual, sir has surpassed even Palais and come up with this fantastic. Meal. I think the next eight plate I'll be doing by the Nagda's modification of the Palais method of eight plating. So, just a couple of questions, sir. Uh, one is uh, about the direction of the screws. Do you put it parallel? Do you put it slightly divergent? And secondly, there are some people who ask me, why don't we put a locking plate? So, uh, so what are the answers? Yeah, I'll answer both the questions. Yes, so, as far as uh, screws are concerned, it uh, you know, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, you can't put convergent screws because it will go into the growth plate. It will be very close to so. Parallel screws are safe way to put it. However, during some indications, you have to put divergent screws. And examples, if you are very close to skeletal maturity, you, do, you don't want to leave a slack in the system. And in that case, uh, you know, you would put divergent screws. Divergent screws offer uh, little play. You know, the amount of correction which occurs through play become less. So I prefer parallel screws in normal circumstances, not divergent screws. Because then the plate will bend and it will act like a staple. When you are correcting uh, limb length discrepancy, you know, this rule doesn't apply. So here, one option is to put divergent screws because you don't want the, the plate to take place because there is no role of angulation here. But I found that as compared to divergent screws, uh, locking screws are much better when you're correcting limb length discrepancies. Locking screws are not good when you're correcting angular deformities because otherwise it becomes a staple. And uh, for me, again, these locking plates have become redundant because I'm using screws with, with bilateral eight plate or bilateral locking plate for correcting limb length discrepancy. We do see a restriction of knee motion for a very long time, which does not happen when you're using screws. So that's why we have shifted to screws uh, for limb length discrepancy corrections. I hope that answers your question. Perfect. Atul sir has a, has a comment, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Atul, please. Uh, two things. Uh, I think that point about getting early function is very important. And, uh, you know, you've seen that some children take up to four weeks to six weeks to get the range. And I, I think in particular in girls, uh, I think that becomes a challenge. So. Uh, the other point I want to make is nowadays you don't need actually an elbow x-ray to determine the bone age. So there is something called the uh, Fell score and there's an app available. You don't need to do an elbow x-ray. You just put the data on the app and the Fell score is what we've been using. So you can determine the uh, skeletal age of the, of the patient uh, just on the knee x-ray itself. And the, and the other point is there are times where there is a discrepancy between the uh, the elbow uh, growth as well as the skeletal maturity. So you find the children a bit shorter. They haven't achieved that height potential and already the epiphysis is showing signs of fusion. So in those cases, you know, I've not uh, done a formal study, but we've done MRI scans of the uh, distal femur and proximal tibia to see how much is the facial uh, percentage closure open. And sometimes you will be surprised that even if the hologram facial is closed, there will be only 10% of the uh, facial closure on the MRI scan. So I think there is definitely some lag. And we've been doing then the uh, eight plate or growth modulation based on the MRI <laughs> scan. So I've not actually formally uh, done a study, but we've got a fair amount of uh, work on this where MRI scans have been done. And it shows a discrepancy between the facial closure of the Olicron. So I think use the FEL score. There's an app available called the uh, Skeletal Maturity app. And uh, it's very easy to download. It's both for iOS and for Apple. And I think try using it. It takes a bit of time, but it's a brilliant app for doing the bone age. That was just my comment. The only issue with this uh, knee thing is you require original uh, raw film of the X-rays. If you click an X-ray as we always do with a with a mobile phone, that, that uh, it's not very accurate. Date. There's an option of putting a date of the X-ray. So there is an option. Right. So you put right. the date the X-ray was taken, uh, the birth age, the birth, and then there is a proper scoring system. I think it's worth a try. So you don't need an additional radiation to the elbow. Mm, secondly, we are working with a machine learning platform, uh, you know, with uh, Institute in Pune now, so that, you know, from the knee X-ray, as Atul has been saying, 
you know it will directly give you a bone age and tell you whether growth modulation is viable or not that app will tell you. so i think people will have to use less and less of their minds and depend more and more on the apps i think atul you are absolutely karan uh do you prefer to take out the implants like we prefer to take out the metaphyseal screws usually so that if there is some growth which is remaining and if the deformity still recurs so we can just put a single screw so would you uh, what is your routine practice no no we we i remove the entire implant because by keeping implant in place we have had some problems issues and complications no no and I'm, by the time I'm, you want to do the implant the next time that play, that the, you need to use a longer plate anyways you know so so i i have done this in few cases and but nowadays i remove the entire implant in case growth modulation is required later on then i just put a screw now so i have stopped using plates so you know that question doesn't occur in in our occur for me so it will be plate initially correct remove it if later on you require growth modulation i'll use a screw one last question by chandak sir and then we'll go to the next one absolutely sir it was a excellent lecture how do you choose the shape of plate do you use curve plate for femur and a straight plate for tibia or uh, any these specific? are titanium plates sir. so you don't have to do anything to the to the shape as you are putting the screws it automatically gets adjusted okay you don't have to pre bend it at all okay and okay. and last sort of last tip of the lecture if um, andar allows me he is modulating this session very well but uh, you know one last tip is never tighten over tighten the screws you you are not using these screws for fracture fixation you are using for growth modulation so just moderate tighten perfect thank you sir with that excellent lecture on uh, growth modulation now we move on to the next lecture by none other than dr manga uh, mandar agashe who is a co director for the hip preservation services at srcc and associate honorary consultant bj wadia hospital mumbai i have seen couple of presentations and corrections of hip by mandar and they are excellent so mandar can you please start on your lecture um, how to keep the head round painless and mobile a really fantastic topic mandar go ahead thank you very much sir thank you very much to maharashtra orthopedic association for allowing me to uh, convene and moderate this uh, session uh, so my topic for today will be perthes disease so it is basically a, a talk about the concepts and the decision making in perthes it will be less about the surgical aspects but more about the decision making in perthes and how to keep the head round mobile and painless so we all know that perthes is idiopathic osteonecrosis of the capital femoral physis and one of the commonest causes of painless limb and young hip arthritis and why do we treat it because we know that a hip which looks so benign at the time of presentation has the potential to become such horribly misshapen in in the femoral head even in a couple of years this was described way back more than 110 years back by these three gentlemen and there is still a lot of controversy about the etiology natural history and the treatment protocol of perthes disease we know that there are two basic concepts in surgery one is the femoral side and one is the pelvic side where in the femoral side we do something known as a varus osteotomy which has been popularized by professor benjamin joseph and we we have a, a option of doing a sorter's osteotomy both are containment procedures but should you contain all hips so if we get a hip with perthes disease do we do surgery in all patients basically no because some of the conserved hips they do well and some of the operated hips they also don't do well so what do we choose when do we choose a conservative means and when do we choose an operative means well perthes disease management traditionally was very confused so when i was doing residency more, more than 18 years 15 18 years back this was the thing which was taught to me are perthes hai na ruk jane ka har bar x ray karne ka contain the perthes hip only if it is extruded or the head at risk signs are present these were the concepts a few years back but i don't think that they are working currently what radically changed in the last 40 years is professor professor benjamin joseph's superb work on perthes disease over a number of number of years and there have been number of articles from his team at manipal who have paved the path for our concepts in perthes disease 
what they have described is basically interplay of five factors age of onset stage of disease severity of disease exclusion and range of motion let's deal with each of them briefly so age of onset remember these three uh, uh, yeah, one is less than 6 years second is 6 or 7 to 12 years and late onset which is more than 12 years so if you see age which is less than 6 years or this age at 6 years of onset most of the kids will do well no matter whether you operate or you do not operate as against that if you have a child with less with who is between 6 to 12 years of age the chances of you getting a good result is if you operate early hence when you have a child between 7 to 12 years don't wait for exclusion to happen because we know that the results of early surgery are much better than when you wait and then allow it to exclude this doesn't work when the age of onset is more than 11 years when it is a thing called adolescent perthes which is almost like an adolescent avian where no matter what you do the results are not good thus we should know that we have a very brief window of age in which we can make a difference so if you have a child between 7 to 12 years of age of onset of perthes disease don't wait for exclusion see to it that you operate you or at least advise a surgical containment early and don't wait for exclusion second is the main important thing which is the classification the stage and the severity of the disease and from residency onward we were hearing no, so many of these classifications the walderston elizabeth and kalandri herring so many of them so what are these classifications basically these are are, are divided into three types of classification the walderston elizabeth town and kanali are the staging classifications these three are the grading classification and the stulberg the moses and the sds score are the outcome classification so what are these so staging classification basically defines a chronological stage which means it just defines which standard is this boy is so so he is in say second standard it basically tells you the chronology of the disease going further there are grading classification the cattral sort of thumbs and the herring the americans like to use these classifications so these are classifications which are used to prognosticate the outcome which means that if a child is in fourth standard we should know how many marks he is going to get in 10th standard based on his marks in 4th standard so it will help us know the prognosis of the disease at the end of skeletal maturity so it is a grading classification as against that the outcome classification the stulberg the moses and the sphericity deviation score are classification used to define the outcome of the disease that is how many marks this child has gone got at the end of his uh, academic career so stage 1 in the this is stage that is stage 1 is basically sclerosis and avascular necrosis with no loss of height this is stage 1a as you go further the there is a loss of height this becomes stage 1b 2a and 2b are where there is more of fragmentation based on number of fragments and stage 3 is where there is a small amount of reossification which occurs at the periphery so this is a stage of reossification where there is a fluffy bone at the edge of the lateral pillar it can heal up either in a good way in this manner or in a very very bad with sequelae uh, this is the stage 4 so when do you contain again an excellent article by professor benjamin joseph said that 1a 1b and 2a are excellent candidates for containment so if you have a early perthes disease don't wait for exclusion don't say that abhi ex- abhi to exclusion nahi hai to kyu contain karna hai contain it early see to it that the stage of fragmentation is in the acetabulum and thus this can lead to a very good result so this is a green signal for containment stage 2b be very careful you advise containment only if the child has maintained good range of motion as against that stage 3a and 3b are not good candidates for containment because at that time the head has already become bigger and that is why it is will be very difficult to contain it i'll tell you what to do for that these hips later on once you know the stage of the disease we should know how to grade it and know the severity there are a few classification which is the cattral classification where it describes about 50% and more than 50% the herring lateral pillar classification and it shows that a severe disease has a poor prognosis thus the operative method is better 
in more severe disease. So if you have a stage, uh, a herring which is very severe, better to advise surgery early rather than later on. We should also know that extrusion is important when the child is less than six years of age. So if you have a child who is less than six with extrusion, then you operate. Otherwise, after six years, do not wait for extrusion and operate early. Range of motion also is very important. Do not operate on a stiff hip. In case you have a child who has restricted abduction, wait, give bed rest, give traction. If it is not improving, then take under anesthesia, do an examination under anesthesia, do a medial release, give a petri cast, and only then contain. Thus, the treatment plan till now is, remember to contain if a child is between 7 years to 12 years without extrusion, or if it's below 6 years with extrusion. Early stages are the best way to contain. If the range of motion is normal, that is the way to, to contain. However, do not contain if it's very early child or a very old age, if there is less severe disease, if the stage is late, or if the range of motion is poor. However, what to do for the uncontainables, which are the late presenting problem? We, we get so many cases with Perthes disease which are late. How do you contain these uncontainable hips? This is the good Perthes which we described about. Age less than 7, early disease less than 2B, good range of motion, less collapse with a spherical hip. But what do we do for the mischievous kids? How do we turn these kids into a masterpiece? Well, the problematic Perthes are those which have early loss, early stage of basic disease with sudden loss of range of motion, the irreducible hingers, the large head with collapse, large head with impingement, or a overgrowth of the head. I'm going to talk briefly only about a few of them. What does late presenting Perthes mean? So we have a stage 2A where we have otherwise a very spherical head with a good acetabulum. However, when we have a stage 3A, it's not just this. The actual head is having a big amount of extrusion and large coxa magna head. And as you can see, there is this bicompartmentalization of the acetabulum. And there is something known as hinging. We always ask our student, what is, is does he have hinge abduction? So what exactly is this hinge abduction? So what happens in a usual case of Perthes disease, which early, which is containable spherical head, you have the center of the rotation at the center of the hip, center of the femoral head. And as you abduct and you say do an arthrogram, you can see the dye filling in equal amounts. So the medial joint space is equal to the lateral joint space. It's an equal joint space which is there throughout. As against that, if you have a coxa magna head, here the center of rotation is lateral. So what happens is that it, it hinges at the lateral edge of the acetabulum. And that leads to increased medial joint space. So the definition of hinging is basically increased medial joint space as you abduct. So that is basically known as a hinged abduction. It is hinging at the lateral border of the acetabulum. These are not good candidates for containment. So what do we do? We do something known as coverage. That is, we cover the extruded portion of the femoral head that is what we do with the help of a shelf acetabuloplasty. So you have a head which is large, which cannot be contained inside. So you cover the femoral head with the help of a shelf like this. So what I have started doing since the last eight, nine years is something known as a secured shelf osteotomy. So what is done here is that we create a slot on the superolateral portion of the acetabulum, the superolateral ridge of the acetabulum over just above the capsule by reflecting the reflected head of the acetabulum. These sort of uh, slots are created from the outer border of the iliac crest and they're fitted in after which uh, cancerous bone grafts are put and it is then fixed with a 3.5 mm recon plate to keep the graft in place and to prevent withering. Now, this is how it is. This is the slot which has been created with the help of an osteodome. And these are big corticocancellous struts which are placed inside and after which a, a three to four hole, hole recon plate is bent so as to keep the graft in place. So this is how it is. This is one of our first cases in, in July 2014. You can see now that the head has become completely covered with the help of this shelf. And this keeps in place. You can see that two-year follow-up. You can now see that the head has become spherical and with a good coverage. 
so you should remember this is a salvage procedure this is not something which which uh, you should do in very early disease this is salvage and this can be used when you are de dealing with an extruded head this has been described very well in 2011 and hopefully uh, we are in the process of writing up our cases and we'll be able to publish it in the next few months there are a few other options which i'm not going to go through uh, in this lecture because it's out of the purview Basically, if it's a big head, what do you do is reduce the shape of the femoral head. That is by something known as a head reduction osteotomy. Now, this is something which the Gans uh, school of thought and we, we have, uh, uh, have been described. And we have been doing a significant number of these cases through the safe surgical dislocation approach, where the head becomes very irregular. And we reshape the head by doing intra-articular osteotomies and uh, try to uh, give a better life to the femoral head. Thus, to take home in this entire talk, we know that Perthes disease is the leading cause of early hip arthritis and it has to be treated well and early. Remember the five factors for decision making. Age of the disease, stage of the disease, severity with the grading, the range of motion and whether the child has extruded or not. The good containable Perthes are the, age, are the Perthes with age of onset between 7 to 12 years with a good range of motion was not extruded and an early stage less than 2B. But you should always also be able to treat the non-containable perthes. Uh, shelf acetabuloplasty is something which is which is quite good for these cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manda. Wonderfully covered uh, and cleared all the doubts about either containment or shelf procedure. Any questions, uh, Viraj, to uh, Mandar? Yeah, Mandar, excellent uh, presentation as well as excellent cases. Um, any problem uh, of uh, hinge abduction, what we talk about for the shelf cases in long term or any kind of arthritis? I mean, your experience, you are now six, so, seven years of. So, sir, shelf is something which, uh, which has really baffled me about why it works, but it does work. We are basically creating a ledge of bone on the superior aspect of the, the capsule, just above the capsule. And we are hoping that that creates or stimulates enough bone in order to form something like a pseudo acetabulum there, which is preventing the femoral head from going out. So what we have seen is that we it retains a very good amount of true abduction, even at the long term. Uh, the kids, the, the hinge abduction may, most of the times almost completely disappears. And the most important uh, advantage of this over a uh, simple varus osteotomy is that there is just no lurch in these kids. Um, we, I saw a few kids, so uh, we routinely do varus osteotomies, but we have to really explain to the parents that the lurch is going to be there for a long, long time. And uh, uh, at least my experience is that, that it takes at least one and a half, two years, even more for that lurch to be better than what it was before. We, that, is the, that is the complaint which most of the parents have. While the shelf is something which is, uh, the kids are extremely comfortable. They don't require any mobilization. They, they, they can be mobilized very fast on, on a walker very soon. And with the help, with the addition of that plate, I have seen that it doesn't wither off. So the plates, uh, the, the, the shelf remain in place uh, even with the long-term follow-up. So we have about seven, six, seven years of follow-up uh, for, for our first cases and they are doing really well. Longer time or you take out? No, no, no implant okay. removal. Because that's going to be completely within the abductors and right. I put a lot of bone graft over the plate also. Okay. So it's going to be covered with, with bone. So that is what I tell them that there's no implant removal which is going to be possible in a secure shell. Good. Very good. So it becomes rather than keeping the head round, the acetabulum round. Exactly. So, so uh, the other thing is in, in old cases, which I just briefly mentioned, you should see that the acetabulum also changes shape. So if you have a spherical acetabulum and the, then the head starts extruding, it has a typical mushrooming kind of acetabulum. So bicompartmentalization of acetabulum is something which typically happens. And what the shelf does, it then, so this is again, uh, there's no uh, uh, scientific study to it, but this is what we have found in our x-rays, 
is that the head then starts articulating in that lower portion of that pie compartment. So there is some pressure from from above in order to prevent that extrusion from happening. So that and, is something which yeah. I feel is an important. Thing. Yeah, Abhi, you wanted to. Uh, Manda sir, uh, I mean, in recent advances, you know, there are quite a few. So what is your thought process on when they talk about uh, bisphosphonates and hip distraction and things? Bisphosphonates in the early stage and the hip distraction for your late presenting ones. What is your school of thought on so, that? So uh, I have. i use uh, bisphosphonates basically for uh, kids whom i am conserving uh, basically in young kids they say treatment nahi karne ka kuch to dawa de do i have been using it there have been a few studies for use in persis this is those has not gained widespread uh, acceptance i have been extrapolating the same concept as you, that used in avn to persis disease so i use bisphosphonates a weekly oral regime for about a year or so and then i stop it i have never used uh, intra uh, legional bisphosphonates uh, i think taral sir unfortunately has that but taral sir has a very good experience with intra legional bisphosphonates for early persis disease again that is something which uh, is uh, hopefully in the next few years we will have some uh, element of uh, certainty about whether it works or not about hip distraction that is one thing which uh, i personally do not agree with i feel that it is something which is an extremely extremely cumbersome uh, cumbersome method but i think it has a bit of indications for very very reserved cases of very stiff hips where you want to get get some range of motion uh, again i am not an expert in in that i will uh, Uh, i think uh, viraj sir may have a few cases about uh, arthrodiastasis about persis disease but again uh, that is something which i routinely almost never never use uh, chandak sir can i ask you one question yeah yeah go ahead uh, today is uh, the, in webinar we have a excellent surgeon dr rm chandak sir as well as sauji sir who has a huge experience of uh, cases trauma as well as cold cases so in your practice sir how many parthis which were either neglected or maybe uh, may not be just or treated at very late stages how many cases uh, you required to go ahead for arthroplasty or or how early you will go for the arthroplasty your experience sir not not early but they present for arthroplasty in late stages somewhere around 40s uh, not earlier than that till that time they usually manage themselves well they have accepted Uh, the problems as a part of their life uh, some problems do happen at the time of marriageable uh, age that is one time where they are really very concerned and they like a solution for that where at that time we don't have a complete solution for them also okay but but arthroplasty very few very few sauji sir your experience so you are muted sir because we uh, all hello ha uh, yeah, now we can listen yeah so go, especially girls uh, at the time of marriage yeah absolutely thank you sir thank you so much so we'll go to the next talk yeah we have uh, uh, dr viraj singhade who will be giving the next talk uh, on a, on a subject which is i think very close to his heart neglected club foot uh, sir Uh, has devised a, a very excellent method of treating neglected club feet, and which uh, I have had the pleasure of uh, of even assisting him for a case and doing a few cases on my own, and it works very well. So Viraj sir is one of the leading pediatric orthopedic surgeons, not just in Central India but whole of India. He has trained extensively in in in, in Mumbai and has been an active pediatric orthopedic surgeon for more than twenty uh, about twenty years. uh he will be talking to us on neglected club foot deformity uh, over to you viraj sir thank you for those kind words mandar thanks to moa dr chandak sir uh, dr sauji sir gadi gone sir and uh, specially mandar for giving me opportunity to present my work over here so um uh, we are dealing in a, actually most of us who are practicing in small centers we do come across lot of uh, neglected cases maybe of trauma or maybe anything and club foot is one of the commonest uh, uh, disease where um, we face lot of these neglected uh, cases and we we have to decide how to manage these cases so 
particularly in central india and nagpur we have surrounded by a lot of tribal population and areas where uh, many cases they have been neglected and we do come across a lot of cases where they have been treated but uh, maybe the treatment was not adequate and they have relapses recurrences and uh, people have tried to or three or four times surgery and still the deformities are there like this like what we see in this picture so what are the solution for these cases so early i mean ages when uh, when we we were we were resident and when we come came out of the medical college and we are gone for the fellowship the the only method what what was imposed in our mind was laser or like jes and all the fixator which used to take a long time for the uh, for the correction as well as uh, the long rehabilitation protocol used to require so i was just thinking what how one door step or one step uh, some kind of method we can offer to these children because their the incidence is quite huge the clubfoot is one of the commonest pediatric orthopedic condition which every pediatric orthopedic surgeon as well as general orthopedic surgeon sees so what are the constraint uh, and what are the options uh, uh, in 2003 2004 was, was the area or the era where a lot of these articles they started coming that uh, we can still treat the club foot neglected club foot with the help of the extended onset indication what they call like serial plaster and then again you give the uh, tenotomy to the tenotomy or releases and it might correct these kind of deformities a lot of uh, articles they they started coming out from other parts of the countries uh, and then the popular methods were like calcaneal cuboid fusion simpler uh, method for the mild deformities and for the severe kind of deformities where already the bony deformation has already started or already occurred then laser or jes or some kind of soft tissue releases and these were the procedure which were the options which were available so what are the problems or what are the demand as far as the patient is concerned because ultimately we are we are here because we have to fulfill the demand of the patient so whatever best is possible we have to offer them in our uh, situation most of the patients what we see these neglected or the recurrent club foot cases they are from poor socio economic status so they they can't afford the afford, i mean a very expensive treatment very limited limited resources what we have they ask for a short procedure where long term hospitalization they don't accept and in our status we get we get most of these cases which are really a severe one like what dimiglio 3 or 4 deformities right so in these cases i thought that we should offer something different so we came out we work lot on 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 this technique and it was published there is not a new method now it was published 10 years ago and before that almost 6 7 years i worked on this technique so this is a technique called as a dorsal closing wedge or the dorsal lateral closing osteotomy it's a combined procedure where we do the plantar fasciotomy to correct the cavus by the percutaneous method we do the tendo achilles tenotomy by doing the Uh, by again by the percutaneous method which corrects the equinus as well as varus and then we go on the dorsolateral aspect of the foot where we take the elliptical incision and we do do the dorsal closing wedge osteotomy i will go step by step and explain every step like this so this is a picture where you can see here by a small incision we are doing the percutaneous plantar fasciotomy here we take a small incision and we transect this tendon tendo achilles completely right we have modified it further now recently that particularly the orthoarthropathic cases or very recurrent or very rigid cases where by the same incision we release the posterior ankle capsule as well right in fact mandar was remaining the case where uh, in the postcon we demonstrating there was a absent talus very very hard and very stiff foot where we have to release the ankle capsule as well so if required from the same incision or by extending that incision we um, release the ankle capsule as well as we do the subtalar release from the same incision then we go dorsally take this elliptical incision like this and then we uh, uh, i mean separate the soft tissues preserve all the tendon go up to the bone and we take out the triangular wedge like this so the wedge covers the cuboid the lateral intermediate and the medial cuneiform and this triangular kind of wedge what we take by the osteotome we take out this wedge and then we close the forefoot to the hind foot like this so that as if we are closing the open book and then we stabilize the forefoot to the hind foot with the help of the 3k wires and then we put the plaster right if the deformity is severe we can take out more wedge so we may include the navicular also or if very rare cases like 
three or four surgeries has been done particular arthropathic cases and if required we might take even the base of the metatarsal as well so depending upon the severity of the deformity you have to decide about the uh, how much amount of the close of wage you are going to take out but most of the cases usually by taking out the cuboid or and a uh, lateral middle intermediate cuneiform is more most of the time it is sufficient so this is after closing the wedge you stabilize the forefoot to the hind foot with the help of the kys right the graft which is the wedge which we we are taken out from that area we take out the graft and we put over here so that we are not dealing with any kind of non union in future we put a simple corrugated rubber drain or simple a glow drain over here we close the wound we make a window after giving the plaster we make a window so that we are able to take take out this drain after third day right so after third day we take out this drain and sometimes if at all some hematoma is there that also can come out from here so that there are no chance of any infection right and then we send the patient home we directly call the patient after 6 weeks where we take out the wires like the plaster was has been taken out now the wires has been taken out and the deformity is very well corrected okay so this is a, a surgical procedure we extensively studied these our cases like morphological functional and radiological evaluation as described by international uh, clafoot classification system and uh, by the dimeglio group and we found that now we have many of our cases we have follow up of 15 to 18 or uh, some for my patient of 20 years follow up and most of none of the patient i must say with the pride that none of the patient had any kind of arthritis ankle arthritis so i think the i, I will tell you the reason behind that in in the subsequent part of the lecture we even compared the neglected as a relapsed club foot and we found that the results were excellent in both the and uh, and this technique was uh, for the neglected as well as a relapsed club foot deformity now this is a illustrative example this is a child who is presenting with dimeglio three deformity right so it work we usually don't directly jump for the uh, dimeglio one or two deformity to the osteotomy if the deformity is uh, one or two or if the foot is flexible we might try still the ponsetti technique where we do give the corrective plaster and just do the uh, simple tenotomy and soft tissue then we might get the correction but i am talking about a grade three or four deformities where you are really wondering what to be done this uh, procedure was like anything so this boy who was seven year old and this was a deformity like this and you can see the gait of the child the way he is walking i think video is not playing na no? yeah yes yeah, playing so this is a pre and post op gait are you able to visualize yeah yeah okay so this was a uh, i don't know there is some problem manda i think there is some issue with powerpoint you should restart it again restart the program shall i start uh yeah but then uh, will it uh, you can switch it off and then again open the presentation okay so switch off so i think this uh, uh, zoom doesn't uh, uh... No, no issues take it easy viraj no problem okay, okay sorry no problem go go ahead yes so i will just i think videos i think they don't accept na no? many times they just there are some software issues so so i'll just skip few of the videos so that but if you see these cases and if you see their follow up uh, the screen is visible chandak yes. sir yeah 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 if you see them see the squatting what the child is doing now this squatting and if you see the good amount of the dorsiflexion at the foot right see the flexibility of the foot this is only possible if you preserve the subtalar joint so if you preserve the ankle and subtalar joint then only this type of mobility is possible right so and that is the beauty of this procedure where we are not touching the ankle joint we are not touching the subtalar joint and that is why we are getting the good amount of the flexibility if you uh, if you go through the moscas articles or few of the other foot surgeons who were extensively in the foot deformities they say if you preserve the talus and if you preserve the subtalar joint and if you preserve the ankle joint nothing like it because that gives a maximum amount of the flexibility or mobility to the joint and that ultimately prevents the chances of the arthritis that is the crux of of, of any 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 foot surgery right so even they are doing the hopping the hopping is possible in these children i still right and 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 that is only possible because we have preserved 
and this is the draw selection and uh, uh, see the moment and even the surgeon can even uh, taste the mobility of the ankle and the foot even uh, intra off on table itself after once you put the kys where you stabilize the forefoot to the hind foot you can taste the and you can check the mobility of the foot on table itself that is the beauty of this procedure okay now this is a child another child who has a recurrent deformity okay and you see he was operated almost four times including the posterior medial release and elezer and other procedure other surgeons had done and the parents were really reluctant to go it for further surgery because they said we have already done enough surgeries now so dr saab if you are really sure that you are going to give some correction or better foot then only you go ahead so i told him that, that we can't give the normal foot because so many surgeries has been done already done and the anatomy has been altered like anything but still i will give the reasonably plantigrade foot and a shovel foot and this was operated with the same technique and you can see the four year follow up of this child now this is a quite a reasonably shovel foot and it has prevented further if you see the pre op gate there was hyper extension at the knee joint what happens because of the tight tendon actually is the, the the knee try to go into hyper extension so there are further changes in the knee joint as well so those changes again can be prevented if you give the plantigrade foot like this and this is a nine year follow up now i have further follow up of this is engineer student now and he is doing excellent right so most of these long term studies and long term follow up our cases they are very encouraging for this type of procedure is another girl where the, the, the again this girl was operated twice elsewhere and we could give the reasonably good amount of the deformity this is the pre op gate of this girl, child and this is eight year follow up now right? i think if you give the squatting to these children uh, with the ankle touching to the foot with the heel touching to the foot i think you have achieved the, the correction of the uh, the club foot deformity so the advantages are it is very i mean it is less expensive it is effective it is single stage and it has very minimal comp minimal compliance is required as compared to the like where do the talectomy is where do the elisero and other procedures it preserves the septalar joint as you are uh, correcting uh, the deformity by closing the lateral wedge there are no much wound problems on the medial aspect what we are seeing in other soft tissue releases right so there are no problems of wound dissection or ruling and all and uh, naturally when you are not dealing with an, uh, the tension the naturally that there are chances of neurovascular damage are again are less none of the cases we have any kind of trouble as well as the neurovascular bundle is there right there are of course some disadvantages like if you see that these children when they walk initially they have some little discomfort because they have never walked on the uh, on the on their, uh, their the sole they have al always they have walked on the dorsal aspect of the foot so they may have a little initial discomfort but i think it is it is there with any procedure and chances of little shortening of the foot what average shortening we found in five year follow up around 1 to 1 uh, 1.18 cm and a long term follow up of now almost 15 20 years we don't have the shortening more than 2 cm i think that is reasonably comparable with even if you see the long term results of the, even the original ponsitis series where in long term they have found that the shortening was there till 1 to 1.5 or even up to 2 cm so i think and club foot if you see the pathology itself and if you get the unilateral club foot the, the 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 as compared to normal foot the the club foot in long term they usually have the shortening of 1 to 2 cm that is a natural uh, pathology of so i don't disagree with these facts and uh, one disadvantage of this technique is you can't correct the tibial torsion if there is severe tibial torsion i will show you a couple of cases of that also that can't be corrected with this procedure we accept that right might be i mean that that require additional procedure now the special consideration what i i was talking uh, to uh, the mandar and in in, in in initial talk of my this talk that uh, now it is what we do if we don't get the correction on table as for, for the varus or the equinus if the deformity is very severe particularly arthropathic cases what we do we just extend this incision and from the same incision we we do the ankle capsule as well as the subtalar release and those surgeons who are not very familiar even if they take the bigger incision i don't think there is any problem because ultimately you have to correct the deformity by by as minimum as possible way what you can right so if somebody is not comfortable with a small incision there is no harm if you go ahead and and and, and correct the, because that will that is the only chance what the child has now this boy who has had a arthroposis he has been operated almost previous six surgeries right multiple surgeries including releases including elezero has been done 
in other countries and then he was referred to me we we gone and we corrected the deformity of the fossils now these are the cases where i had to take the more number of the fish or the more, more no, uh, amount of the bone including the including the navicular as well as the base of the uh, metatarsal as well right and we 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 gave him the reasonably good food the plantigrade and shrivel food he was so happy next year he again came and subsequently opted for the other food i am not saying that this is a normal food but this is a reasonably good shrivel and plantigrade food they are very happy and they keep on sending the message and telling sending the videos that the child is really doing well so um, and then we further extended the uh, indication of our uh, um, our technique we started then working on the neurogenic food as well where the the children were presenting with the meningomyelocele and they are very bad fit with uh, infection osteomyelitis and all so we work we worked on that and we have good series of these cases the advantage is we we take out the osteomyelitic bone and then that that gives a increased chance of healing as well as the correction right so we have a couple of cases where we have five year and seven year follow up of these cases this is a very important uh, uh, case i would like to uh, uh, include in my uh, talk this girl had a deformity like this she was absolutely walking on the reverse feet so we were fond of the extended poncity and i'm still doing using it for the grade 1 and grade 2 deformity so we corrected the deformity with the help of the serial plasters followed by the tenotomy right the the, the tenotomy here is uh, of course is not under local we have to give some anesthesia for 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 the children because they are uh, quite quite a grown up child uh, grown up children and they don't allow you to do the tenotomy in the in a locally so you have to give some kind of anesthesia for that and i could get a good reasonable amount of correction and even in spite of the good splintage protocol she started getting started getting recurrence i kept follow up this girl subsequently the deformity is increases and she required the foot osteotomy in addition to that she required osteotomy for the tibia and this is subsequent follow up and she required a osteotomy for the other feet as well and this is a follow up now i have a huge for almost she is now 22 year old this girl and uh, this is a old video she is really doing well you know absolutely she is doing well so the message from this case again is not that every case is going to respond to a particular technique i think if somebody who is excellent in elizaro he can still go ahead with elizaro there is no harm in that but i think if you go ahead in a single stage and minimum minimum is a technique like this i think you are offering the best there are other osteotomies in the literature like calcaneal osteotomies where people have done the uh, cut the, uh, the calcaneum and try to correct the deformities there are other procedure which has been described like delvan evans and elish blow uh, like if the deformities are mild grade grade 1 or grade 2 still you can go ahead and do this kind of procedures and if required there are other described procedures like osmeterosal osteotomy as well as uh, the people are described the talectomies and the lastly the people are described the triple orthodesis uh, believe me trust me in so many years i had not a single chance to go for the triple orthodesis after after shifting to this single stage osteotomy where we correct deformity and not a single patient where i i required to go to triple orthodesis and in literature they mention that you have to it is a salvageable procedure where when you get a painful and stiff foot and where you have very, i mean absolutely poor function you can do it go ahead and do the triple orthodesis so in summary in flexible deformity still ponsidated extended indication they were you can still try the ponsidated extended indication and if not if you are dealing with grade 2 deformity then you can still go ahead with the delvan evans or lichbow procedure like this and for the special situation when the patient demands one time procedure where grade 3 and grade 4 deformities are there i think dorsal closure osteotomy it works beautifully and it is one of the a very effective procedure particularly for the patients who are residing in very poor areas and country like uh, ours like like in india right so i uh, thank you all once again for giving me the opportunity thank you um excellent excellent lecture sir and uh, a lifetime of experience is about uh, neglected club foot is what we have shown us uh, any questions uh, yes in panel sir am i audible yes, yes. Uh, viraj yes, i sir. just want to ask if it is unilateral deformity then there is a discrepancy of the length of the foot uh, in some cases yes in some cases there might be shortening but majority yeah. cases the shortening will be so shoe shoe wear should be different then different size 
when uh, patient becomes can, adult yeah some some neglected cases yes sir we can we we may advise the different size shoes and with some shoe raise if shortening is there yes sir yeah and we we at our center we are doing jest correction so that is also a, uh, this thing but com- uh, patients uh, compliance is uh, little less yes sir sir one uh, question i would like to ask about basically the equinus right. what happens is that in such severe neglected cases the talus also is completely deformed so even when we do a soft tissue procedure or do a capsulotomy the talus doesn't come back so that the equinus correction is something which we have always struggled with so what are the tips to uh, deal with that especially yeah. when there is a bony talar deformity yeah see the what happens mandar in these cases the all the bones have been deformed not only talus but the calcaneum and all everything is it has been deformed so you are not going to get the normal talus what we get in the normal foot or even the opposite side of foot so we advise the procedure which which i described so you you extend in uh, incision and do the complete subtalar as well as the ankle capsule release it is very important to and i think that takes the more time sometimes even than the osteotomy so spend adequate time for releasing the ankle and subtalar capsule that is a crux and you get the correction even for the arthropathic foot but only thing is you require a good assistance for the small incision if you are dealing with if you are not having the good assistance then go ahead and take the bigger incision and do the release there is no harm in going out for that because that is the only chance what you are giving to the child there but one last question by dr avi okay. yeah you see Virat, that, sir, this this thing even after doing the subtalar and capsule release have you ever had you still not got the equinus and you need to do something else like osteotomy distal have you ever had to do any of that in any of your patients ever uh, sometimes not uh, a correction but sometimes i am i am worried about uh, uh, soft tissue tension you know so after giving the uh, the correction of the deformity sometimes you are not very sure about uh, maybe some time kind of still stretching on the neuroscular bundle in those cases i would recommend to give the plaster in a neutral position or maybe some equinus and rather than going at for the 6 weeks i will take out the wires at 3 weeks i will give under under anesthesia at 3 weeks i will take out the wires and give some further correction if at all that situation is there yeah all right great so uh, for want of time we'll go to the next lecture we have uh, dr atul baskar who will be giving us this lecture dr atul baskar is so um, Uh, i spoke to, uh, about tarul sir as uh, one of the leading pediatric orthopedic surgeons in india uh, atul baskar sir uh, is one of the leading uh, interna- uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon in international field he goes to number of countries he is a person of international repute uh, he is attached to various hospitals in in uh, mumbai including the bombay hospital and is also an honorary consultant at the cooper rn cooper hospital uh, at uh, mumbai So, Dr. Atul Baskar will be talking to us about a very difficult problem, which is the walking age DDH, or as uh, the Westerners call the neglected DDH. But this is something which we routinely see. Uh, so can you see the screen? Yes, sir. So, over to you, Dr. Atul Baskar. Yeah. yeah thanks, uh, Bandar, and uh, uh, great uh, welcome to everybody from the MOA. I would like to acknowledge uh, the MOA for giving me this uh, opportunity to present. my uh, talk on walking age uh, ddh so the spectrum of ddh what we see in practice is highly variable we get children at uh, just after birth uh, before 6 months uh, anywhere between 2 to 9 years and sometimes even older children that had not had the opportunity uh, to visit a health center and hence the ddh has been neglected so we had uh, reviewed our own uh, series of uh, ddh uh, and we found that uh, the mean age of presentation in the even in the unilateral age group was you know almost 23 months and in the bilateral it was even further delayed because many of these children don't have any hard signs in bilateral dh and often they seek uh, opinion from the neurologist and i've got a child who underwent uh, test for muscle dystrophy mri of the brain and then someone did an x of the hip joint and both the hips were dislocated so it's not uncommon to find walking age uh, ddh in the community especially in our country now the challenges are significant for the uh, for the walking age ddh because we have to have more extensional exposure depending on what age they come uh, there may be a need for bony intervention either a varus osteotomy or a pelvic procedure they need more prolonged spica care almost 10 to 12 weeks uh, one particular thing which i have been noticing is they get abductor weakness especially if they been in a cast for longer time and when you do bilateral ddh you know 
uh, one after the other. Of course, there is risk of AVN and complications which can happen uh, in the in the best of the hands. So, uh, redislocation and failure reduction is a common problem. So, for the working at DDH, you really need a good exposure. Uh, so, if a child is older, two years plus, uh, I take the extensile approach uh, uh, just below the anterior uh, superior iliac spine. You feel the femoral artery. You almost go mid lateral to that so that you can sometimes, in a revision case, may have to see the nerve as well. Uh, you can do an arthrogram pre op to document the soft tissue obstacles uh, and then see the do an EUA before the procedure. Uh, once you do the exposure, you, you cut the psoas tendon, the rectus, which will I'll see, show in the subsequent slide. So this is the top end here, this is the leg here, and this is the uh, I split the eyelid crest for the older child so you can get. Uh, um, uh, you can then reflect the abductor muscles without damaging them uh, so that you don't have to do a very uh, do a significant femoral shortening. Here there is the exposure of the, uh, the socket after clearing the acetabulum of the pulvina fat and then cutting the ligament, ligament anteriors of the head. So one must get a good view of the, the socket and you'll be surprised that the socket is really far medial. So you have to resect the psoas muscle and the psoas tendon which then which covers the the middle one third of the socket and then only you can access the middle and the inferior part and one must then reach up to the transverse ligament and, and excise that. Sharing a couple of cases, uh, uh, this was a two-year-old child underwent an open reduction, uh, hip was fairly stable so we didn't proceed for anything else. In a four-year-old child uh, they underwent a bilateral varus osteotomy and I'll talk about the amount of varus one can give. Uh, occasionally one may have to do a SALTAS or a DEGA procedure again, there are specific indications for that. And typically, once you're doing a femoral procedure, uh, especially in the older child, one may also have to do a bit of shortening. And that can be determined by the amount of overlap between the proximal and the distal fragment. And you cut less than that so that you don't make the hip very loose. So this is the proximal fragment. Uh, this is the distal fragment. So typically, some of the children, uh, which, when we do open reduction, a long-term follow-up, we monitor the uh, AI index. And this girl at one year post-op, you find that the AI index is almost 30 degrees. And when she comes back for follow-up, it is back to 20 degrees. So this is the kind of uh, results one can expect, uh, even in a working at DDH. This is a child uh, who underwent uh, varus osteotomy and also a SALTAS procedure. And here is a two years post-op uh, with no limb length discrepancy. Uh, further, uh, this is a three-year-old child. Now, surprisingly, sometimes even at three years, you may not need a femoral osteotomy. So <coughs> the child is different. And depending on the, the soft tissue laxity, um, this child actually, uh, the hip reduced very easily, but because of the uh, shallow AI uh, index, we did a sort of osteotomy and there is that uh, five months post-op and then four years post-op. The head is well contained. Uh, we remove the implant typically at the end of one year, uh, remove the wires as well as the plate if required. And then this is the function we get. So children where we don't need a femoral procedure, I think one must assess the, uh, the, the socket and make sure that if it's very shallow, you get this one opportunity to go in and then do the SALTAS procedure. There's another girl, three-year-old child, uh, which I was alluding earlier that if you don't need a shortening, like this child had a tonus type three hip and one would think that he will, she will need a shortening. But once we opened the, the capsule and cleared off the soft tissue, we found that the head really slipped in easily. And, and those cases, best not to do a, a shortening. Uh, otherwise, you will cause more laxity. And here, it's better to tackle the pelvis. Here, we, again, we did a SALTAS procedure. The graft is taken from the, the ipsilateral uh, eyelid crest. And then hammered here, you can see the triangular graft here. And then uh, we use wires to hold it. So I prefer to do a redirection osteotomy rather than, than a shortening if the hip can be easily reduced. Similarly, if you have a capacious acetabulum, you have a significant uh, uh, gap between the head and the cartilage of the socket. In those cases, you do a lowering osteotomy like a DEGA procedure. Otherwise, uh, if you just want to redirect the, the socket and there's no space between the femoral head and the cartilage, that means that you have a concentric reduction. In those cases, uh, once you do a SALTAS, because if you do a DEGA procedure, it's possible that you will lower the, the head and chances are that you will get a redislocation. Uh, this is another girl who underwent uh, bilateral DDS surgery. At the time, I thought she needed a, uh, a procedure on the acetabulum as well. Uh, surprisingly, you know, there's been, there are reports that if the head is well contained with the femoral procedure, there is gradual increase in the uh, AI index, especially in the first two or three years. And this girl at uh, eight year follow-up had uh, 
completely concentric hips. Incidentally, she also was diagnosed with the Marfan syndrome around six years of age. So uh, we were fortunate that we didn't get any complication at the time of initial surgery when we didn't know the diagnosis. Of course, this was the older child. This is a 10 year old girl uh, uh, who underwent uh, open reduction and, and to my surprise, this girl actually didn't require a pelvic procedure at all. And I was really taken aback because the head was well contained. If at all, she needed a, a, a shelf procedure later on, but I, I left it alone and she continues to do well. She Then she came back subsequently uh, for contralateral uh, epiphyseal adhesives because of the limb length discrepancy. The head was maintained and she was walking. So this was a, a picture when she had the limb length discrepancy. And when we did the uh, growth modulation, you can find, you can see that the limb length is correct. This is another child, a nine year old child. These are the oldest children I've done because they were unilateral. If they're bilateral, I would probably leave them alone. This uh, boy, we did a DEGA procedure and we got the socket down as well. So um, I think you can take a, a call on table when you can decide which procedure is ideal for the child. Of course, we have failures. There can be failures because of various causes. And one of the, the, the problem is the dysmorphic femoral head and excessive femoral antiversion. Sometimes there is inherent uh, deformity of the proximal femur, which can lead to redislocation. Also, we looked at certain factors in our own study, uh, specifically the bony osmic nucleus, and we found that we had a higher redislocation when the osmic nucleus was absent when we did the open reduction. So this is a girl, a 16-month-old girl, where we did an open reduction and a spica. And inside the spica, the, the head slipped, and then we had to revise this. And I think the... The, it's just the structural integrity of the of the joint may be less when there is a, a cartilaginous osseic nucleus and one has to do an enhanced spica care for these children so that you can monitor the, the hip uh, even after the reduction, do a CT scan or, or an MRI scan and document, you're able to maintain the reduction. There's another child of 13, uh, 13 month old. With the, there's no bony osseic nucleus. Uh, he was treated in the hip spica, redislocated after two weeks and then we had to revise it. This was the uh, redislocation, the head just became lateral and then we had to revise this. So I'm not suggesting that we delay the surgery, but one must be extremely careful in terms of uh, assessment of these children and make sure you have a very good spica mold uh, and have a good follow. There are uh, okay, several causes of failure. One of them is uh, leaving the hip dislocated and sometimes you reduce the hip in the false socket. Like in this case, the hip is here. It was reduced in the false socket and the, uh, the surgeon didn't appreciate that medial uh, uh, part of the socket. Uh, this one, uh, this child underwent three surgeries. You can see they had a posterior approach, anterior approach, a lateral approach. No, sorry, never an anterior approach, only a lateral approach. Uh, why is inserted and this socket was never cleared. And this was uh, when you do an excessive derotation with varus, sometimes it can lead to dislocation posteriorly. So you have to be extremely careful when you combine a pelvic procedure with the varus derotation so that you don't decrease the antiversion. Again, this is what uh, I've seen in practice when you have, we have bilateral DDH, uh, one must uh, actually uh, wait until the you do one side, let the muscle strength improve and then do the other side. And I, I have two cases now where I had, I had a good initial reduction and then the hip slowly drifts apart. And I found that uh, main, this child had a, a low or weak abductor power less than grade 2 on the other side, the power was good. And I'm not sure whether this is a technical issue, whether it is because of the inherent muscle uh, hyperplasia, but I, I have two hips now, which are drifted slowly away uh, after a good open reduction. So bilateral cases, I, pro, I now prefer to do a stage procedure, but keep a gap until the first hip has recovered in its muscle strength and then go back. Because if you go back immediately, the chances that the muscle gets atrophic. So I don't know. The answer for this, we've not done any EMG or nerve conduction, but I had two, three, uh, two complications where uh, I'm unable to really answer that. So how much virus one can give? Now, I think whatever virus you can get to contain is important. But at the same time, one must not go beyond 90 degrees. Up to 110, 120 is, is acceptable because I found that remodeling in these children is, is very good after you remove the implant. So in two to three years, you find that the, the uh, femur will remodel. Although the child may have a bit of a limp or lurch, but the aim is that the hip is contained. And uh, so one must not worry about too much virus, especially in a revision case. Uh, some cases we use a transarticular pin, especially in revision cases. Sometimes even in the primary case, I use it. 
because uh, you know we work in different hospitals so we don't have a consistent assistant or a consistent technician who can help us with the spica this girl was a revision case had previous surgery um, so we we did a open reduction a dega ostotomy and here she is at uh, three year follow up where hip is well maintained this is the child I was talking to earlier where the hip was never entered so it was easy for me to go from the front everything was was you know was uh, was virgin territory so i could clear the whole uh, soft tissues the the muscles and then uh, got this hip back in and did a solter's procedure of course she was very stiff to begin with she regained only 50% function she was unable to squat fully uh, but these are the challenges uh, with the you know previous uh, attempts at uh, failed procedures this was my case which i did uh, early in practice where i did excessive femoral derotation excessive varus and i thought this will be a real problem uh, in the future and then as this girl came for follow up i was really amazed uh, at the remodeling potential and i i couldn't believe that so many varus could remodel i had actually uh, counseled them that she will need another procedure later on because there was a revision surgery and uh, you know one has to really counsel the parents so this child fortunately uh, did very well and uh, to my amazement and really completely remodeled so the key thing is to control every step in the walking child right from the incision to the spike application make a, make sure you have a good assistant who can actually hold the the leg well after you done the procedure otherwise you can get a problem even at this stage and john wedge from uh, was one of my mentors said ideally the surgeon should control the the hip and have a good assistant who can apply the spica uh, of course prevention is, is the key and sometimes uh, uh, it is not possible in, in our setting where there is no hip surveillance so this girl we did a surgery she had a bilateral ddh at age 4 uh, the mother was pregnant at the time when we did one of the hips when the child was born uh, she was concerned so we did ultrasound scan and even the sibling had bilateral ddh and she we put them in a spica so i think this is really is the crux where we can diagnose these problems early around so that we don't see a uh, walking ddh and we had some uh, brochures made initially in our practice to give to the pediatrician some it didn't really catch up but we looked at how you can examine the hip in one minute but most pediatrician in the busy clinic uh, don't have time uh, because in the child the howling and and there's no place for them to make walk but if they can do the simple test in the clinic at every stage when the child comes i think we can save the uh, walking age ddh so in conclusion i will just uh, express my gratitude to my teachers my mentors my guides and fellows and especially bob salter who was there at the time when i was doing my fellowship so thank you very much mandar for giving me this opportunity thank you sir for this excellent uh, overview of a very difficult problem which is walking ddh uh, so any any questions from the uh, from the uh, other faculty members yeah atul excellent talk um any uh, specific uh, uh, counseling you do for the late present or four or four or five of the age group when you are operating for the cdh particularly when you give the virus because that takes a little more time for the remodeling in the late cases sorry sorry viraj i didn't get the question i think there is some audio there is some uh, viraj are you talking to two devices Sorry, no, no, I'm I'm having only single device. So some some echo is there. I don't know. Now no, no, now it is okay. Yeah, I think someone else had uh, yeah. extra device. So my question is Atul, uh, what kind of special counselling you uh, give to the parents, uh, particularly late presenting uh, DDH for so the virus? What we give because that takes longer time for the remodeling. No, so I I think normally I counsel them that there is the, our aim is to contain the hip joint. That is the priority. and whether i need to give more varus whether i need to give uh, uh, um, a do a pelvic procedure and you know i also counsel them there is a high risk for these children to get uh, avn or stiffness i think one must counsel them and uh, i don't comment too much on the shortening because shortening is something which we can tackle but uh, i think stiffness is one thing one should counsel them because they'll be in spike for almost 12 weeks especially this late presenting ddh so you know you and i always do an interval cast change at 6 weeks do a wound check if i've used the wire i will remove the wire you know i've used wires in more than 100 cases now i had a single uh, hip infection yeah. provided to keep the wire buried don't keep the wire outside the skin otherwise there's significant granulation tissue around the wire which can cause uh, infection in the skin and the subcut and the plaster smells a lot so till i bury the wire and i always change do an interval cast change at uh, you know 4 to 6 weeks remove the wire 
uh, especially in the revision case. So I would counsel the parents that I would put a wire in. I've not had a case of stiffness or infection with the wire inside. But certainly if not, if I've had re-dislocations because of muscle weakness or sometime, you know, it's just an inexplainable. You've done the best and suddenly the hip drifts out. And I've had that on a few occasions. And then you just have to put your hands up and counsel the parents. In those cases, you go back in, uh, you know, and do excessive errors. So I think that would be my, my answer to that. Any special so, precaution is, for uh, neurogenic cases like meningomyelocele and bilateral, there is a dislocation. Any specific precaution you will take for the decision making whether to operate or not? Yeah, so if the child has got walking potential, so really I don't think you can take a decision very early for these neurogenic uh, DDH. I think one can one has to see them uh, uh, not only as the hip but also as the other issues which are there. So if the child has got good muscle power. Now I had problem with the AMC where I've reduced them and again, there's no abductor power. And over the next for three or four years, the hip just got lateralized. And I've now realized that you must give importance to the abductor strength at any stage. And if you can't assess the abductor strength, then all the more reason to counsel the parents that it's chances that the hip may drift out because there's no muscle power. So that at least you have given them one, uh, you know, you have one explanation at least. So again, for same thing with the neurogenic type, I think you must look at the <laughs> muscle power. Don't look at the joint only. Look at the child, uh, you know, in, 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 in the entirety. And if possible, take a neuro opinion, uh, you know, do an EMG prior to if you feel there's any issues. Uh, I think you have to be really uh, treated with a lot of caution in the neurogenic uh, DDH. Sir, two questions, sir. One is, uh, what is your bracing protocol after the hip spica removal? And secondly, uh, uh, sometimes... Uh, I mean, uh, you get a very relatively young child, say around 8, 9, 10 months, you have attempted a close reduction and you are not getting a close reduction. So what is the earliest that you attempt to do an open reduction? So if uh, if a child at 8 to 9 months, uh, I'm not, unable to get a close reduction and I find on the orthogram, there is significant uh, blockage or the hip is high. In those cases, if the child is not walking, I'll go ahead and do a middle open reduction. Now, if the head is high and you can't really get it inside, then I would go ahead and do an anterior approach. So I've done a nine months. I've done the anterior approach because you're familiar with the territory. Uh, you know, it's much easier to do it at that stage. Yeah. I've done very few middle open reductions. So unless the child is six to nine months, you know, I've done very few of them. But I prefer because I'm comfortable in my hand. I can do a good open reduction, you know, in that age, uh, in 45 minutes and get the hip in. But the key thing you said is the spica care. The spica care post-op. So these children, when the spica comes off, I give them an abduction brace just for three to four weeks so they don't cross their legs. And uh, I tell the parents do a self-selected, uh, you know, mobilization. So I don't refer them to a therapist because sometimes they're more aggressive. So I tell them if access to a pool is possible or a water uh, where you can put the child in the water, let them kick in the water, uh, give them a, 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 like a tricycle where they can kick the legs in and start walking as soon as, you know, at three to four weeks when they have muscle strength. Uh, if you make them stand too early and they have no strength, you know, they just collapse. So wait for the strength. I assess the strength at six weeks, eight weeks, and I find good after the power more than three. I then tell them to you know start independent walking. So last question by Saudi sir. Then we uh, I want to ask. You said that you will not do bilateral at the same time. How much interval between the two? So ideally, in the past, what I was doing, I was doing one hip, uh, and when I do the interval cast change at six weeks, I would do the other side. And I've also done one hip first and then after the spiker comes out, after 12 weeks, do the other side. But now I'm a bit skeptical because I have these two cases where I did it, you know, one after the other. And I found that uh, the abductor strength didn't improve. So I feel now better to stage it, let the hip recover completely, maybe three to four months gap. Once they get the abductor strength, then go and do the other side. So I don't think there's any hard rule in the, in the textbook, but, um, you know, earlier I would do it... Uh, um, after six weeks or immediately when the spiker comes out, but now I want to stage it. Uh, if they are syndromic feed, uh, syndromic uh, DDH something and they are small, you can do to, you can do simultaneous. You can do both together in the same setting, but that's very rare in the walking age DDH. You can do it together. Great. Thank you very much, sir. So we have uh, Dr. Avisha and Dr. Chasnu Rathod uh, who will be giving the uh, doing the case presentation. Yes, so I, think, I think are we uh, there's a there's just a common presentation by the I'm still muted. 
So no, no. Yeah. there's a echo coming from somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, Abhi, you can go ahead. Yeah, I'll uh, so I'll share uh, Chastal's presentation first, so she can go first, and then I'll go after. Yeah. I'm going to introduce Dr. Chastal Rathod is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I'll share Chastal's presentation first. Uh, yes, so. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for. Is everything okay, Manda? You can hear me because I think there's some issue with the internet as well as the laptop. We are not able to hear you. That's why we are not able to hear you well. Okay, so I'll just switch to another device. I just add me to it. I'll just. Avi, why don't you present your cases first and then we we'll like Sure, to... I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah, perfect. All right. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Manna sir and uh, MOA for letting me a part of this. So I'll be presenting a few uh, hip cases. So uh, case one. So she's basically a 11 year old female who came with complaints of uh, pain in her left hip. She had difficulty in uh, uh, sitting and squatting and she has a limb length discrepancy. So there were no previous records uh, present of any treatment taken or something like that. But the parents gave a vague history that at uh, one year of age, she had some fever and hip pain, but there was no treatment or any records. So this is her, this is the way she walks. You can see from the front and from the side. So she does have quite a bit of a significant short limb kind of a gait uh, pattern. Her leg is quite short and entire pelvis uh, tilts to one side. Uh, so this is her at standing. So she almost has around a five centimeters femoral shortening and her uh, left side, if you see appears, there is a quite a lot of muscle wasting, not only in the thigh, but even in the uh, calf region as well. So in her clinical examination, basically she has reduced abduction and external rotation, but she had quite good uh, flexion and adduction range. And these are her x-rays. So now at uh, this point, I would like to ask all our senior panelists, if Virat sir is there, Atul sir and Mandar sir, like when such kind of cases come to you from the beginning, how, what kind of process do you go through and uh, what comes to your mind and how do you plan ahead? Uh, we'll, we'll start with Atul sir and Virat sir first. Yeah, Atul, you can. Atul. Okay, so Atul is there. So, oh, Abhi, it's, yes. I would, I mean, investigate, I mean, I, I will go into the depth of the history because it seems to be more likely of sequelae of some kind of sepsis, maybe neonatal sepsis or maybe, because many times these children who are coming from the villages, they are, they still have the deliveries at PSCs or at home and, you know, and they are not bothered about the sepsis, sepsis part. So, if even if you ask them the history, they will not uh, tell that some kind of infection has been occurred in the past. So, at least on x-ray, it looks like a sequelae of septic arthritis in the past. As far as the management is concerned, so I think uh, this will require some kind of neck lengthening procedure, if, 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 if I'm not wrong. Um, um, uh, neck lengthening procedure will not only give uh, the stability, in addition to that, that will achieve some length also. So, the gait will also improve. I think that is, uh, yeah. but again, you have to warn because she is just now 11 year old. So, I think we have lost him. Yeah. Uh, Atul sir, uh, what do you feel we should do? Yeah, there are couple, so right now she is totally asymptomatic, no fever? Uh, no, no. She has not had fever ever. Only time they said she's 11. They said right. maybe at that one year age point. After that, she's never had anything. Yeah, so a couple of points. I think if you look at the plain x-ray itself, you know, there's a very, very wide uh, astablum. I think this obviously must have been a sequel of sepsis where the socket has got, uh, you know, softer and got wider. The other thing is this, the shallowness of the socket as well. So, 
the, the I think the AI index may be almost 50. The because the C the center's angle is probably negative. Now I would probably get a, I would first get a CT scan done, or three D CT scan and see the uh, the orientation of the socket because on the on a plain X-ray one doesn't know which wall is deficient. Uh, I think there's a lot of entry deficiency in this child. So uh, you know one has to do a CT scan and then uh, do a planning. Uh, uh, but this hip already is in valgus, so I'll need to see the next shaft angle because we create more valgus, the hip may dislocate. So I think one you do a 3D CT. Uh, the options are, you know, if she's really symptomatic, she got five centimeter limb length discrepancy. You have to also adjust the limb length. Uh, so I would counsel them that uh, uh, it, it, this hip is she painful at all, or does she just come for? She shopping? has she has some pain, but mainly a lot of restriction in abduction and external rotation. Correct. Correct. So I think if you do, one can counsel the parents, one can do a, a SSD kind of approach, get the, do a relative neck lengthening, get the trochanter down. It may not be easy. So sometimes I do an abductor release at the top so that you don't stretch the, the nerve. Uh, you can do a, a containment osteotomy. Uh, after doing the osteotomy, you probably uh, may not need a lot of valgus here. But do a neck lengthening, get uh, some reasonable uh, valgus so that you get a neck shaft angle 130. And then do also a socket. I think we need either a triple because it looks fairly congruent. So you mean need a triple procedure to get the head contained. Um, and also at the same time, counsel the family if she's only 11 to do a contralateral uh, epiphysiodesis or address a shortening at a, at a different stage. So this would be my approach to this. Uh, uh, Manda, sir, you have any comments? So, uh, so now I know what uh, we did for this, but. Uh, uh, basically, basically, I agree with Sir uh, with Atul Sir. What he said is that there are uh, a few components, especially since there is uh, under coverage. To do a valgus osteotomy will mean that uh, uh, it's going to uncover that uh, that acetabular deficiency, and she's going to be unstable. So um, I feel uh, we should tackle the femoral side first, uh, either by doing a SSD with an osteochondroplasty and uh, a relative neck lengthening. But I think the safer thing to do is uh, do a do a simple uh, uh, triple osteotomy, the the neck lengthening osteotomy described by Mosher, and uh, get correction of almost all the things except probably the limb length. Uh, though limb length also can be corrected to some extent by about uh, one and a half to two centimeters by that. I think we can go ahead with. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. So as everyone describes, so she has a large capacious acetabulum, small head which is deformed, oval shaped, and the greater trochanter is very high so there are deformities at multiple levels so as atul sir and everyone says we, had, we need to go in a stage manner so as uh, dr mandar suggested there is a osteotomy known as the mosher's osteotomy where we do uh, uh, three uh, osteotomies and we pretty much reshape the entire proximal femur so as there are various options one is with safe surgical dislocation or this approach for this patient we went ahead with this kind of an osteotomy and there is various literature for the use of this osteotomy in post septic sequelae and perthes like hip deformities to get a good neck length and with this osteotomy you can get a true neck length instead of a just a relative neck length which we sometimes get with the safe surgical dislocation so in pre-op planning we did check in abduction and adduction views you can see that in adduction the head completely gets uncovered hence you should not do any just a valgus osteotomy which a lot of people might think about so with planning uh, we decide there are uh, there are three osteotomies which are going to be done so this is done in a normal lateral approach you put your guide or as you do for your normal dhs uh, for uh, uh, the angle uh, which we have decided and we put our k wires to plan as per the osteotomy which we have planned initially so uh, once first first is you put your screw and be ready with it and then is we do the osteotomy of the greater trochanter and you remove the uh, sized uh, piece of bone which is already pre-planned and that is the bone which is going to give you that extra length in your neck and then you plan your distal osteotomy and we place the bone uh, graft into the plate which adds to the neck length and then here you see using the clamp once we put the plate the shaft gets uh, lateralized so that we are correcting the axis and you tap the plate to uh, uh, make sure the bone graft sits inside and the last is the proximal greater trochanter piece which is left is which you fix back on top and that we have fixed uh, with KYS and done a uh, 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 SS wiring uh, tension band. 
so this is her preoperative uh, image you can see we have corrected the proximal femoral anatomy we did gain some amount of length not as much as we need yes she does have still a capacious acetabulum but on table it was quite stable and i've let the family know that she might need a secondary acetabular procedure in uh, in time because if you are thinking of a lengthening procedure there are sometimes high chance of uh, issues happening over there and this is her follow up at one year in ap view it looks very good in frog lateral yes you can see there is quite a lot of anterior uncoverage and even the head is larger but currently she is uh, painless and not having issues and planning for the next stage i'll go quickly with the second case so this is a 4 year old girl uh, abhi can you when we have chasnal's cases yes yes now, yes so that, i'll do uh, that uh, if she is there if we have yeah, to go back yeah i'll put to I'll, another device now and this <laughs> for me one and um, thank you mandar and thank you uh, moa for having me for this webinar so the topic is i'll be doing a small case presentation about recurrence in secondary club feet we did see virat sir presenting about uh, treating the recurrence in club feet or deformities residual deformities in club feet as well so here the point is uh, secondary club feet Uh, Abhi, you can shift to the yeah. next. Yeah, thank you so much. So the secondary club feet are usually the ones which have neurological causes, the ones which have spina bifida or MMC syndromic arthrogryptic. They aren't really similar to the idiopathic equino cavo varus. They are slightly different in terms that they are more rigid. The recurrence rates are more higher. and even the recur the repeated recurrence would be much more as compared to the idiopathic club feet here and uh, yes so that's why i picked up this case so let me just go through the history quickly this child is a 4 year old child and the child was diagnosed with meningomyelocele at the lumbar junction antenatally the child was operated for the same at 8 months and the bilateral club feet was being treated during the infancy uh as the mmc was given more importance the plaster cast started little later ideally which should have been done little early and uh, then the tenotomy was not needed the brace compliance with the child was little bit doubtful the parents gave me history that after one year around one and half year or nearly two years of age there was again a recurrence and again two plasters were done and recently now at age 4 uh 6 months ago the parents again noticed this recurrence and re again the plasters were done and they gave me a history that there was a fracture while plaster and the plaster continued for 2 months so the child presented to me now at age 4 this is how the child is the child is a myelomeningocele child and if we look at the uh, foot deformities here they look very mild looking four foot adduction or mild supination with slight heel off but when you actually feel this feet they are very rigid feet and with the repeated amount of recurrence and the plastering the child has gone through that's what makes this feet different from the regular idiopathic club feet so can we have the next slide so considering the history of a fracture i got some x rays done for the child and this is what i saw so we see that on the the more of the supinated foot instead that so the right side actually symptomatically and uh, visually is much more deformed and has lot of deformities but if we look at the left feet where the fracture actually happened so you see that there has been a forceful equinus correction also there was a fracture i think there has been a also a distal tibia fracture also which has happened because we see there's a lot of callus because this is almost nearly 3 2 3 months post the plasters and apart from this there was a large swelling at the distal end of the tibia also so i explained the the simple thing that now the fracture and this will remodel and heal and we need to treat the opposite feet so can we just go to the next slides and i have few points to discuss with the panel so uh, yes yeah, so in such cases mmc 
how would we consider that the uh, plaster technique should be done anytime under the GA if repeated recurrences are done? And do we anticipate such problems of fracture or a flat top talus if done under GA? So maybe Virat sir, we can have your opinion followed by Atul sir and Chandak sir. If you sir. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Chasal. Wonderful case. Uh, yeah. See, my approach in these uh, neurogenic cases is like that. When they come as a neonate, we usually counsel them. We show them the previous cases, you know, where there are very high chance of recurrence and all. So we correct the deformity uh, during the neonatal period and then we keep, uh, keep the strict bracing protocol. But in spite of strict bracing protocol, the deformity is going to recur. And we usually wait till five or six years as the age group. We don't repeatedly go, go ahead for any kind of surgical interventions. And we usually do the osteotomies maybe at the age of six or seven or eight years. So that, that is the final procedure what we are doing. Yeah. Right? Again, but that has to be again followed by the splintage protocol. Split, as split, the normal yes. food. What normal food, we don't give much splintage protocol after bony correction or after doing the osteotomy. But in these neurogenic cases, still we have to give because we want to protect them from further recurrences. Secondly, many cases, yes. sorry. Yes, sir. Please. Continue. Secondly, many of these cases, they because of because of neurogenicity, they have the weak bones, you know. So there are likely chances that they might develop fracture. What what this case uh, had because sensations are issue, then the osteopenia is issue. So again, that thing has to be mentioned. If if I would have been treating this case, I would still wait further. I will not jump for the osteotomy at this stage. I will still yeah. wait further. And then I will further go for the definitive procedure. So as you suggested, sir, I have asked them to wait because this is the first time they have visited me. And I'll plan a procedure after some time. And with the next slides, I'll just show you a similar treated case. So this is a similar age child with almost similar history of three-time recurrence. We see the child walks here with more of a dynamic supination, that is adduction and inversion. And the child also has an increased thigh foot angle and a tibial intortion. So, uh, comments from the panel, Atul sir. Uh... So, typically, you know, we one would see this kind of uh, tibialis anterior overactivity, and also you see the uh, torsion of the foot. So, this child uh, underwent any surgery before? Uh, no, sir. Uh, just tenotomy and plasters twice. Yeah, so sorry. one set of tenotomy and plaster and again a retinotomy and ponseti cast. So these ones, you know, I would actually again serially cast them and uh, uh, probably do a tib and uh, transfer along with the abductor halluses uh, tendon release and uh, let, and see if the torsion can improve with time. So my approach would be to actually uh, do a soft tissue release if it's tight on the middle side to a tib and transfer and, and cast them. And depend more on the casting because these feet, uh, you don't want to do any major joint surgeries very early on, like Virat said, and cause any stiffness. And again, splinting becomes very important for these. And, you know, sometimes I give them two or three pairs of splints. So including an abduction splint, an AFO, and a walking shoe. So the parents can, you know, divide that time and at least use 20 hours of splinting. Because otherwise the recurrence rate is just going to uh, be very high, especially in a child which has already got dynamic supination and uh, torsion. Yeah, thank you, sir. So, uh, next slide. I treated this child with a tibialis anterior transfer. So, the supination was not static. It was just dynamic due to tibant overactivity. And because the tibial torsion was uh, quite uh, visible, I did an additional supramalleolar derotation osteotomy. And if you look at the next slide, the video, we can appreciate how well the tibia derotation has helped to achieve a straight foot progression angle and uh, there was a lot of uh, thigh foot angle was quite deranged so usually I don't prefer doing a tibant uh, a, a derotation at a younger age I still wait for beyond seven or at least nine for the child to remodel naturally with just tibant transfer but because this was a MMC child and there were history of previous surgeries and he had a uh, he was operated before for a femoral in, internal rotation as well. So VDRO was done on him before previously. So can we have the next slide? And as uh, Atul sir emphasized, and also Virat sir, bracing is a very important uh, thing. And brace compliance is what forms 80% of treatment in all of the types of club feet. 
And if you look at this, so this again gives us a very nice view of how TBL and torsion is much more as compared to the T-band. So if we hold the feet in a solid AFO, the TBL in torsion gets enhanced. So that additionally confirms that uh, doing a TBL osteotomy will help us get rid of this dynamic supination. Had it been just tibialis anterior, the AFO would have corrected it and it would have made it look straight. But because there is an underlying bony thing, so preoperatively, when I checked this child with the AFO, that's how I additionally decided to do the supramalleolar osteotomy. And the next slide, please. So all of these kids, usually we tend to follow an a la carte approach and depending on whatever the deformities are accordingly, surgeon to surgeon, we prefer adding or doing some additional procedures along with whatever needs to be corrected. And a quick take home message from this case would be uh, the last slide, please. That yes, these feet are, uh, we can we go to the next, ah, yeah, thank you. So that these feet are certainly different from the idiopathic club feet. And we have to know that when to stop casting. Recently, I saw a child which had undergone 16 plasters, a 16 plasters for a child with AMC with a recurrence. Which could have, which I have treated in a similar way with a lateral column shortening osteotomy and band transfer. But I think it's important to know that when we need to stop the casting, review and maybe revive at that point. If not possible, if we could refer to a higher center where club feet treatment is being done uh, more methodically. And additionally, in such secondary club feet, we need to check the neurological status. The first child which I showed you had developed sores in the plaster. So the plastering technique, as well as the need for a balancing surgery for tendon transfer is very important in these case. And of course, the strict brace compliance is extremely important in all sort of club feet. So that's it. And thank you so much. And uh, sorry about the technical glitch. And thank you, Avi, for helping me through the slides. Thank you very much, Arsenal and Avi, for, for these two excellent cases. Uh, uh, so I think we are exactly on time for, for uh, our schedule. Uh, I would like to have a few words uh, from uh, senior uh, consultants, Dr. Kiran Saoji, sir, and Dr. Chandak, sir. Sir, you have to unmute, sir. Hello. Uh, we have a fantastic webinar. We have learned so, so many things about the pediatric uh, orthopedic. Over to Chandak, sir. Yeah, Mandar, that was an absorbing webinar and you moderated it very well. And all the lectures had a lot of take-home messages. We learned a, quite a few of things. Both the case presentations were also very good. So... It was well um, managed, Manda, by good moderation, good learning points. And we hope we have a series of pediatric webinars in future as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much, sir. Thank you. So, uh, I would like to thank the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and um, Ortho TV for organizing this, um, uh, this uh, uh, Veteran Surgeons Forum for Pediatric Orthopedics. I would like to thank uh, Gadegone sir, Sauji sir, and uh, Chandak sir for their guidance for this uh, session. And uh, we can ca call it a day. We are exactly on time at 12.30. And I think every one of us can enjoy whatever the remaining weekend is left for us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Unam, I think we can stop the recording. I think we can. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, leaving. Yes, sir. Bye -bye. Bye, Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. So, Viraj, you are back. Viraj is... Viraj, able to connect again? You are muted, Viraj. Thank you, Saoji, sir. We thank you, thank you. Chalo, Fantastic. Thank you. So, we, we have a series of pediatric webinars now? Four? Two. Abhi do ho gaya na? 
सो दिस वाज फर्स्ट पीडियाट्रिक नो स्पाइन के तीन हो गए नहीं नहीं पीडियाट्रिक के दो हो गए ना इसके पहले कॉला कौन सा था एक हो पीडियाट्रिक का हो गया ना इसके पहले मंदारी था ओके हां राइट इन द बिगनिंग अपना हुआ सो सो टू मोर वी कैन हैव लॉट ऑफ गुड टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम पीडियाट्रिक या नेक्स्ट वेबिनार वी कैन प्लान इट आउट एंड वी विल पुट अप द डेट्स या चलो thank you so okay. much okay. thank you punam you can delink and uh, stop the webinar